an assignment like we've undertaken, both in speaking on the Beatitudes, whose symbols we find, the eight windows, and also creation and the five seasons in the beautiful stained glass windows is a bigger assignment than I thought it was. And uh, I probably wouldn't have had the courage to speak and say I was going to try to do that had I realized what an assignment it was. Nevertheless, the folks who are here allow me to be less than what some, people's, some people allow. Some people want the sermon all finished and polished and uh, fixed up in a certain way. And I come to the pulpit with rough notes and sometimes no notes and sometimes with notes I never use. And yet, God helps. God has had mercy on us. Martha, that's such, such an appropriate song. So sweet. Just think when you girls first got together, you ladies, you couldn't make a sound. You couldn't make it harmonized. They kept working at it. So God brought this beautiful harmony through so we could have the songs of Bill Browning and the Browning Boys and some others. God's blessed us. But without Jesus, we're nothing. And I'm conscious of it today. It's something to know that and something to experience then in the greatness and mercy of His love, His wonderful Spirit sweeping in and flooding your soul. That's what I felt up here this morning. Isn't it wonderful to have a service that has dignity yet has an informality a freedom, a spontaneity of the Spirit. Isn't it wonderful? Yes. We're not a slave to anything. We appreciate, we're thankful, and are instructed to pray the Lord's Prayer. I have chosen in my ministry to bring back to the Free Church uh, the Apostles' Creed, which I believe is so valuable, to try to span the difference between the differences between the Free Church and the Higher Church or the liturgical churches. Because I feel like that we are one or should be one. And I enjoy so often going into the churches abroad, the churches at home, and worshiping with uh, those churches who are more liturgical. But I only enjoy it where I feel the Spirit of God. And where God's leading and working, there is beauty, and there is worship, and there is dignity. And there is orderliness. We're so thankful for His presence and His beauty here today. So you, you bear with me. I feel I may have given more attention to this throughout the week, but I feel less prepared um, on the subject of summer. The stained glass, which represents summer, is the one, the third glass. You'll notice that from creation through spring and through summer, the sun at summer reaches its highest peak. In Psalm 74 and 17, the psalmist speaks unto God and says simply, Thou hast made summer. Thou hast made a summer. And it's around that text, out of that verse 17a, that I want to share with you here this morning. Why were you and I so excited with summer when we were children? Spring was wonderful, but summer delighted us even more. Why? Why? I mused over this question this past week and recall several things. Vacations, travel. I just simply wrote down a number of things while I was in the air. Visiting friends and relatives, swimming, chasing butterflies, catching lightning bugs, 
hide and go seek, bicycling, camp meetings, fresh fruit and vegetables. Don't you think this is quite a variety of a list? And, when I, and in parentheses, I have watermelon, tomatoes, corn on the cob, okra, and black eyed peas. Cookouts, picnics, the ice cream man, or the local Dairy Queen. Shower baths, the smell of fresh cut grass. Fishing, baseball games. The 4th of July, fireworks, parades, short pants, long hikes, and selling Kool-Aid. <laughs> but not everything was delightful, like bee stings, Wind storms, underground shelters. Mom, I couldn't help but remember that when we went to Naylor in the summertime, the grandpa had a underground shelter. I don't think your folks used it much, but the neighbors surely did. The first sign of any uh, storm in the sky, here came the neighbors, and into the cellar they went. One of my biggest worries one day was the fact that they went in and I went in, but mom and grandpa and grandma stayed out. And I thought, Lord, surely if this earth is blown away, I'll be saved and they'll be gone. Why don't they get in here? <laughs> well, the sky was not that threatening, but the neighbors felt that any uh, storm was a storm to get in the cellar over. And so... <laughs> So I remember this very well. Long hot days, burnt crops, sunburn, cut feet, and goodbyes. No, not all pleasant, but memorable, nostalgic, and poetically pungent. Summer inspired Shelley to write, it was a bright and cheerful afternoon towards the end of the sunny month of June when the north wind congregates and crowds the floating mountains of the silver clouds from the horizon and the stainless sky opens beyond them like eternity. All things rejoiced beneath the sun, the weeds, the river, and the cornfields and the reeds, the willow leaves that glanced in the light breeze and the firm foliage of the larger trees. Why was summer so great? As I looked over the list of things experienced, both positive and negative, I noticed variety, refreshment, and fruitfulness with cognates like contrast, Leisure and adventure. Summer, more than any other season, depicts the total experience of man under the sun of righteousness. I repeat, summer, more than any other season, depicts the total experience of man under the sun of righteousness. Spring is emblematic of our conversion experience. But summer is symbolic of our sanctification. And this by its very nature means things both positive and negative. The joy of forgiveness contrasted with that first step of self-denial. You see there's pleasure and there's pain but total experience. For Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The assurance of sonship, together with the chastening that every son receives. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Being led by the Spirit, but into a wilderness of temptation. 
And the contrasts go on and on and on. The dominant feature of the summoner is the sun. And I've had you note the window and also the explanation in your bulletin that's given to us by our architects or artists from England. Psalms 19 mentions the sun as being emblematic of the law. And you'll notice that in your, in your bulletin. But I want to read from the Living Bible the whole psalm. The heavens are telling the glory of God. They are a marvelous display of His craftsmanship. Day and night they keep on telling about God. Without a sound or word, silent in the skies, their message reaches out to all the world. The sun lives in the heavens where God placed it and moves out across the skies as radiant as a bridegroom going to his wedding or as joyous as an athlete looking forward to a race. The sun crosses the heavens from end to end and nothing can hide from its heat. God's laws are perfect. Now we have what it symbolizes, the law of God. They protect us, make us wise, give us joy and light. God's laws are pure, eternal, just. They are more desirable than gold. They are sweeter than honey dripping from a honeycomb. For they warn us away from harm and give success to those who obey them. But how can I ever know what sins are lurking in my heart? Cleanse me from these hidden faults and keep me from deliberate wrongs. Help me to stop doing them. Only then can I be free of guilt and innocent of some great crime. May my spoken words and unspoken thoughts be pleasing even to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The law in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, the Son is emblematic of Jesus. For it was John who wrote that Jesus was the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Well, you and I know as Christians that it is Jesus. That Jesus is the light that searches the heart to reveal any wicked way. And that's painful. But it's necessary and it's good. For with the pain, he also provides healing. And amazingly, it's the Old Testament which says that Jesus is the son of righteousness who shall arise with healing in his wings. In our hymn book, there's a song that D.S. Warner has written. I can't remember the title. Oh, yes. Who will suffer with the Savior? And in the course, it says something to the effect that in him, pain is pleasure. It's not a sadistic view. It's not an enjoyment of pain. But it's an appreciation for the necessity of pain. The experience of summertime, the experience of sanctification has that for us. But it seems to be the experience that men reject. So great fear had one man in a former pastorate of my father's some 30 years ago that he said, he, he, he believed he'd just be saved but not sanctified. There's no possible way. And if there's a theological problem with you this morning about sanctification, let me dispel it. Because I'm not arguing on an instantaneous work. I believe that there is a crisis experience whereby we bring the heart unto Christ and we seek cleansing. That's out of the springtime of conversion we find there's a great need. For we find there is a battle similar to that which is in Romans 7 going on. And yet we come to God for the power to overcome this sinful nature. All sins have been forgiven. 
But we see that there's something that's in us, deposited from the experience of Adam, that causes us to be other than what we're supposed to be. Thank God that He has provided not only the springtime of conversion, but the summertime of sanctification. As far as I'm concerned, here is where the real beauty is. Here's where the real experience is. And here's where many of us begin to back up. Some of you have enjoyed services here without any burden, but when the burden comes, then you tend to not appreciate it so good. It seems to me that we should be just as thankful. I know when I say that, that I'm weak, that I'm very human, and that I have a tendency within my own nature to shirk back. But you see, it's, it's the power of love that undergirds and provides the strength to enjoy both springtime and summer. It must needs be. It must needs be that Jesus go through Samaria. The disciples didn't want to do that because it was the place of sanctification for them. It was a place where they had to deny themselves. And yet, there was a woman who awaited them there. And our meat is to do the Master's will. And the Master wills that we have the experience of sanctification as well as that of conversion. It seems to me that if you're very adventurous, that you would be delighted with summer. Because a man cannot be mature without experiencing the heat of summer. A man cannot love his family as he ought to love. A man cannot love God as he ought to love without the pain of sanctification without the chastening of the Lord, without the experience over and over and over again of self-denial. Unless it seemed to be too hard, remember that while sanctification is taking place, there's also times of refreshing. While the purging is taking place, there's also times of coming apart to be refreshed. Jesus said to the disciples one day, and he said unto them, Come ye yourselves and rest a while. And notice what it says. For there were many coming and going, for they had no leisure so much as to eat. I've never preached a sermon on the theology of leisure, but I think there's scriptural basis for it. And without the lifting, without the refreshment, and without the times of refreshing, the pain of the summer of this life or the summer of the Christian experience, which is sanctification, would be too difficult for us all. God has made us a promise that He had not come too late. God has made us a promise that He's with us in everything. God has promised us that He would take us through. And when we lose that vision, we simply lose the vision. And the vision is, as I sent back to Pastor Steve this week from God's servant as we sat around the seashore, that God is real and that Christ is Lord. Any man that has, I said, Brother Helm, that's your vision. That's what you, that's what you were able to see when you were very, very young. That God really is real. Murmuring and complaining is a sign that we really don't believe it. Wanting to do other than God's will is a sign that we want to be Lord and not Him. But it's in the experience of summer that God brings us to maturity 
and the fullness. Now remember, summer means zenith. And it means zenith without decline. And so there, though there's an experience of the negative and the positive in life, because rain falls on the just and the unjust, but in the summer of sanctification, there is no decline. It is always upward. For as we obey and we go from conversion, I want you to be encouraged with this because when some of you come out of conversion, I don't mean you come out of it, you're always converted, but when you come through conversion and you lose the joy, that is not the joy, but you lose the dewdrop of blessing, you think you're declining. No, you're not declining. We must go through the desert. We must go through the summer place. We must go through the hard place. Because it's preparing us for a better place. And it's preparing us better to be used by the master here. Without summertime, there's, there's, not, there's no wisdom. It's the wisdom. You take a young preacher who's on fire, his Stephen Reinhardt, in his young days, he'd get up and call the church to task and tell them they were going to hell for not obeying God. Amen. Well, it wasn't that his words were wrong. He was right. But in his later years, <laughs> if you don't believe he's in the summertime, just have him turn his head around. <laughs> Summer's showing up on him. <laughs> now, not autumn, not autumn, not autumn. This man is in a beautiful summertime experience like the which I have seldom seen. But as he, as he walks with God, as he experiences certain results of his words and certain, uh, certain reactions toward what he did or what he said, he has a tendency to speak more carefully the next time and wiser the next time. And here, here, is, here is the prayer that God's servants need. To be able still to speak. To be able still to proclaim, to be able still to declare, but then that's all a part of the learning experience of summertime. That's the reason I think that my ministry is such a miracle, because there isn't any desire in me if I can tell it all to preach at all this morning. And so why? Because of my own failures, of my own needs, of my own past sins. And yet I plead the blood of Jesus Christ, and I look forward to the Word of God and to His promise. Not to back down on my failures, but to declare the word unto you on the promise of his victory. I go by the word of God. Jesus said he was going to help us this morning. That's good enough for me. In spite of everything, that's good enough for me. Stephen and the fellows were praying for me and they told me he had a wonderful prayer meeting last night. And then Brother Helm called about 11 to see if we were okay. And he said, Jesus, I was praying an hour ago and you said you were going to anoint Oliver in the morning. Well, that was good enough for me. I said, Jesus, if you said you were going to do that, then by God's grace. Now, the, the wonderful part about it, if you've been following me carefully, by God's grace, that anointing's already come. Oh, I tell you, I love it when God comes on me and I'm able to put my foot down and a finger in the air and feel the fire go through my body and burn your feet and heart up. I like that. I'm glad. I'm real glad. But can you tell when he comes in summer breezes? Can you tell when the soft wind is just blowing slightly? We were sitting at a table by the seashore where Brother Helm, Barbara and I were yesterday and Jesus came by in sweetness and gentleness. So much so that I couldn't keep the tears out of my eyes. Otis, I fell as hard as a rock. You know, outwardly. I said, Jesus, here I am. I'm tired and I'm burdened. I've tried to rest three days, but I'm still tired and I'm still burdened. And I'm here in front of God's servant that prays and prays and prays and keeps tender and fresh before God and I feel as hard as a rock. He didn't make God any difference. He broke me up anyway. I'm telling you, he told me things. He told me things about the scriptures, about the demoniac of Gardea. Oh, I tell you, I was so thrilled. I didn't hardly know what to do. 
and burden. I was weeping over souls and weeping over men because he pointed out that the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin who ought to have known the Christ did not know him at all. But when he got on the other side of the shores of Galilee after that big storm, that man who didn't even know enough to put clothes on, he knew who Jesus was. And he knew more than the religious leaders of his day. God transformed him. I thought, dear ones, that one experience right there, if you're experiencing the negative of summertime, that one experience right there ought to give us hope here this morning. That man was demon possessed, was run away from his family, and, and was despised by men. But Jesus came across his path just at the right time. And we find him in a few moments clothed and in his right mind. Now, I want you to get this, but God gave him summertime right away. Right away. He had the experience of conversion. He had the thrill of meeting the master. And who'd ever want to turn loose of Jesus? Mary didn't until he had to say, stop clinging to me, Mary. Touch me not. I've not yet ascended unto my father. Well, I don't blame her. The wonder, the wonder is she ever turned loose. Oh, such is the heart of love as exemplified in Mary. I don't think the love has quite been equaled as found in this beautiful woman. But here's a man who found him and here's a man who loved him and he said, let me go with you. Summertime comes quick for the demoniac of Gardea. He says, go back. You see, they came out and said, get away from here. Remember in the picture? Get away from here. Go away from here. We don't want to have anything to do with you. Jesus said, you go back and tell them all the things that God's done for you. Summertime began right away. How did he feel? He was hated. He was despised. He was rejected. He didn't know if his wife would receive him back or if his children had anything to do with him because he'd been filled with devils. God sent him right out. Sanctification, dear ones, starts right after salvation. And I know that my background in the church of God, it ain't going to work. That statement ain't going to work, but I'm going to declare it anyway and the Holy Ghost witnesses to it. How do I know that? Because he said, if you're going to follow me, any man that's going to follow me, let him deny himself. Right there, brother, it starts. Take up his cross and follow me. Not every man in my heritage would disagree with that. They're, they're, but you see, our theology has been, as it crystallized from Wesley, you get saved and then you get sanctified and then almost angelic-like, you walk the rest of the way to heaven. Uh, see, I, I was out of Kelder because I got saved and I got sanctified, but I wasn't like an angel. I couldn't figure out what's the matter with me. Well, the, the summertime's a little longer than they used to preach, Stephen. It starts right after salvation. And it keeps going all the way to the gates of death. Because Mother Speck told me that the devil was still tempting her and bothering her and buffeting her on her deathbed. And she said, son, if it weren't for Jesus, I could never make it. But God's got the power to take us through. No man can pluck us out of the Father's hands. Oh, I'm having a great time here on summertime. If it hadn't been for Brother Hellman getting here, Oliver, I was so crushed over this very thing you're talking about. Yeah. Just crushed over it because I knew certain things needed to be taken out. And, yeah. and uh, Steve says, they were Steve telling says, me I wasn't supposed to do certain things if I really knew God and were sanctified. Right. And I needed help from the Lord so much. Just like probably many people here this morning been the, told the same thing. If we, if we have the seed of God in our heart, yeah. we sin not. And you've explained that. Uh, yeah, the Greek says it, that if we're born of God, we cannot continue to practice sin. It's, like, it's not the rule and habit of our life. But bless you me, folks, if anybody in this house that hadn't sinned uh, since they've been saved, you meet me after church, I want to talk to you. Yes, what we'll do is build a shrine around here. Yeah. 
Yeah, because anybody, only the Lord was like that. <laughs> Hell, we'll build something around here and say, hey, uh, here's a man, the only man we know of in history that didn't sin since he's become saved. Well, aren't you glad for 1 John 1, 9? Speaking to the Christian church, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now you keep this in mind. I do believe that God saves us. And I believe the scriptures make it plain. He does not want us to sin. And he wants to lift us above through the power of his spirit into the highway of holiness and walk with him. And that the habit and the rule of our life should be that of such beauty and such love that we're like Jesus. The demoniac began summer right away. And what happened? The next time Jesus came back, the whole village was there waiting on him. Oh, think of it. Think of the hard knocks he took. Think of, the, think of the cross. He had to bear a cross. He had folks that wouldn't believe him for a long, long time. But as they watched him, this man who was genuinely transformed, this man who was saved, and this man that God was working to sanctify as he talked to him from door to door, night to night, they saw he was a different man. They saw that Christ was really real. Brother, the next time Jesus got there, Next time he came, they were all waiting on him. They wanted springtime in their soul. I guess maybe they wanted summertime because this man exemplified summertime as well as spring by the very act that he went back. He didn't say, Jesus, if you, if you don't let me go with you, I'm not going to do it. No. The scriptures indicate that he obeyed, that he denied himself. And don't you know that was difficult? took up his cross and he followed him. To have gone with him physically wouldn't have been following him. But to do his bidding, that was what it meant to follow him. It is in the experience of summer, of sanctification, that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. The knowledge that God is in control, coupled with the refining work of sanctification, ought to bring us to maturity and give us the spirit of summer. I've spoken to you on the experience of summer. I want to speak to you now on the spirit of summer. What is the spirit of summer? Contentment. True spirituality. Oh, I'm having a great time, Stephen. <laughs> In the same letter to the Thessalonians, the apostle Paul wrote, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Amen. Sanctification and sanctification... And in the middle of it all, giving God thanks for everything. And it's all the will of God. While he was in the Philippian jail, he wrote, For I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know how to be abased. And I know how to abound everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Then he says in the next verse, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. That's what won those old soldiers to Jesus. Boy, when I got down there in the Mamertine prison, I was doing all right till I, I mean, composure wise, till I got to that sign that said, while the apostle Paul was here, he won more than 47, more than 47 soldiers to the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know where they got it. Tradition, I suppose, but I know that God witnessed that he won soldiers. Yes. Brothers, they looked down through that old hole at the water and the rats, and they saw that this man had the victory. This man had summertime in his soul. Yes, sir. Brother, he had the victory. He said, I have learned. He's writing from prison here now. In whatever state I am, to be content. Brother, there was a Roman soldier standing up there looking at him. And he didn't have contentment at all. He couldn't figure out how he had it. And the man on top didn't have it. 
the prestige and the dignity and the power of Rome, the education and the, and the, the, um, the, the games and, the, and the, all that went with being a Roman citizen. And yet the man down in prison had more than he had. He had summertime. Contentment. For prison bars do not a prison make. It's an attitude of the heart. And then the writer to the Hebrews exhorts, let your conversation, that is behavior, be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. The ground of our contentment, the ground of our peace and composure in our summertime experience is that he says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. We forget it. But we're here to renew the vision. This then is the spirit of summer. A quiet disposition and a heart giving thanks at any given moment. And that is a real test of the extent to which we love God. So says Dr. Francis Schaeffer. And that's the real indicator as to whether you're responding right to summertime. This is the spirit of summer. Longfellow wrote in this same spirit, O summer day, beside the joyous sea, O summer day so wonderful and white, so full of gladness and so full of pain, forever and forever shalt thou be to some the gravestone of a dead delight, but to some the hallmark of a new domain. Depending on our response to the experience of summer, We bring forth fruit. For in a real sense, all experience summer. The results can be very bitter or very sweet. When I was talking to Margaret Myers, I found that the results are very sweet. Deprived, malnutritious, Despised, She said, you know, son, when I go downstairs to visit the people, she said, I'm rejected. If the master was, so shall it be with us. I'm rejected. But she said, you know, son, she said, it just makes me love them all the more. And I'm having such a great time. And though I'm poor, I'm ever so rich. Oh, I could tell it was true. The words that she was saying. I think the real indication that we've responded right to the experience of summer. And this is what the experience and the spirit should yield something. Should yield fruit. And of course, the spirit, the fruit of the spirit would be the composite of this. But isn't it all summed up in love? The summation of the law and the prophets is to love the Lord thy God with all thy soul, mind, and strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. But it takes summertime to bring us to maturity in this commandment. Without it, it's an impossibility. The man who illustrates 1 Corinthians 13 has experienced the summer of sanctification. Can I read it to you again with that thought in mind? Now we see a little more how it's possible. The outworking. Because only a man who's experienced summer. You know, when I say read about love, I like to put a name in there. Why don't you just put yours? and I'll put mine. And remember this, that faith embodies what is and what should be. And so in creative tension, I plead with God that I shall look like this as I go through the summertime. 
of sanctification in my experience. Now, I'm so happy. I'm almost just, it's all I can do to keep from just crying. I am so blessed over God's help. So when I say this, I'm not speaking, I'm speaking of the possibility, but I want you to put your name in. After some, after summertime, it should be said of Oliver that he is very patient and kind, never jealous or envious, never boastful or proud, never haughty or selfish or rude. Oliver does not demand his own way. He is not irritable or touchy. Oliver does not hold grudges and will hardly even notice when others do him wrong. Oliver is never glad about injustice, but rejoices whenever truth wins out. And when Oliver loves someone, he is loyal to him no matter what the cost. Oliver will always believe in that person, expect the best of that person, and always stand his ground in defending that person. But it's not possible without summertime. Because there's things in my heart that are very unlovely. I know this by what comes out of the mouth at times. And so I plead with God, let me not be weary in well-doing. Let me not shirk back when the ignominy and the shamefulness of the cross is brought to, brought to bear. Let me be willing to deny myself that that spirit of summer that banner of love, which indicates that I belong to the Christ, shines for all men to see. For Jesus himself said, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, that you have love one to another. They'll know you've been through summertime, folks. And then when he shines through us, in fact, the Psalms 51 and 2 I quoted earlier is so blessed along this line. The mighty God, even the Lord, hath spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the get, uh, going down thereof. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shined. That's us. That's Israel. But that's us, the spiritual Israel of God. Maybe you think it's not too appropriate for me to read this next poem, but me thinks it is. Dante and the Brownings probably had greater vision than most people as to what real love in another person, for another person really was, because in their writings, they realized that unless the immediate presence of God was between two people, you cannot have real love. And the Brownings write that way. And Dante writes that way. You're probably not familiar, most of you, with Donna, Dante's preface to the infernal and purgatory and paradise. By the way, I have a great time reading all three. Dante comes out quite a quite different man. But before he wrote that, he wrote a, a book called The New Life. La Vita, La Vuno. The new life. And in it, he adores one named Beatrice. She was his love. Though he never held her, he never loved her. But she was the love of his dreams. He met her when she was nine years old and again when she was 30 and then she died. But something would happen to him when he would get in her presence at nine. His heart was just, oh, just thrilled. And then again at 30 and then she was gone. But he never forgot Beatrice. And so he made her his patron saint. Now, I don't want you to be aggravated with me because I say words like that. If you got very much anti-Catholicism in there, you're in trouble. But I've been trying to get that out of people. 
You can't even appreciate the thoughts and the dreams and the beautiful things of these writers. And I'm not one who believes in purgatory, nor do I pray to a patron saint. But I'm like Sue S. Lewis. I pray with them. Brother, there's a communion of saints, and there's saints praying going on in heaven. And C.S. Lewis says, don't get aggravated with the Catholics. There's a fine line between praying with them and praying to them. We don't want to do that because Christ is the mediator. We know that. But you see, it would take the meanness out of us and the harshness. Dante, in his great, the great heart of this poet, illustrates so much. In his lovely Beatrice, he finds the love that he seeks to be his own. And he finds something beautiful. And he finds the power and the strength to go through summer. Somehow, the beauty of what she really is and what he saw and what he thought her to be carries him through the hard places. Well, I mention all of that to get ready for another poet. One that isn't so lofty in love as Dante or um, as the Brownings, but I learned this poem when I was very small. Little did I realize that it had such an eternal quality in it. It was written by Shakespeare. It was the first one I think I ever learned, other than the 116th sonnet. And it goes like this. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shine the eye of heaven shines, and often in his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometimes declines. By chance or nature's changing course untrimmed, but thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wondrous in his shade. When in eternal lives to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe, our eyes can see. So long lives this. And this gives life to thee. Whether Dante or Shakespeare... That which causes us to ever have hope, that which causes us to ever be encouraged is a love that never fades, that has resulted from a summertime experience. And this summer shall never cease. It's in the beauty of the soul that loves God and that walks with God. Thou hast made summer for you and for me. Shall we stand? Heavenly Father, you're so precious to us today. I should be, and I will be, the first to repent. Forgive me for pulling back. Forgive me for not seeing that the invisible cup contains both positive and negative blessings, but all blessings. Forgive me for not denying myself when I should. Forgive me for not shouldering my cross with gladness. Forgive me for not obeying Thee that I may be cleansed, that I may yield unto that which has been ordained of God in the summertime 
of sanctification. I wish to be beautiful. I wish to be loving. I wish to be holy. I wish to be faithful and I wish to be true. I pray, O Lord, that I'll not draw back from your chastening hand, but rather rejoice, at least after it's all over, to say, I'm not a bastard, but I belong to God. He is my father, and Jesus is my elder brother. Thank you for making summer. Without it, there is no autumn. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.